Welcome to the Guild Family Stream. Brethren in Christ, Laudate of Jesus Christus in Sequila. This is the Guild Family Stream. The first 10 minutes or so will be publicly available. Uh, the rest of this presentation will only be available to Guild members. As I discussed in the spiritual reading challenge, Guild membership requires one, daily invocating, inv invoking our patrons for the, the intentions of the apostolate and the needs of the Guild members. That's invoking our, we have three laymen, three lay people, Our Lady, St. Joseph, and St. Anthony. So prayer every day, it takes about 15 seconds to do it. So 15 seconds of prayer and financial contribution. So all the people who get this full presentation uh, are, are making those contributions to this whole apostolate. And we're going to be just discussing a rather controversial subject, bishops against bishops. Obviously, this is a reference to Our Lady of Akita, which we'll discuss in a minute. Um, this is what we'll be going through. So this is the, this is the full presentation that we'll have here. Uh, this is a systematic review of bishops against bishops. And uh, so we'll go through Casper's Eastern Orthodoxy and it, how it was condemned by Cardinal Ratzinger. Uh, Our, Our Lady of Akita, obviously, bishop against bishop, cardinal against cardinal. His Holiness pa Pope Francis reopens the controversy. And uh, we'll talk about Aidan Nichols. Uh, Nancy Pelosi was excommunicated uh, and Cordelione versus Wilton Gregory and Francis. Cardinal Muller's and Cardinals Muller and Pell, their comments uh, on and which go against synod on synodality. We'll also talk about Bishop Barron. Bishop Barron had some interesting things to say a couple months ago. And then we'll talk about the most recent controversy over Eucharistic coherence, Bishop Paprocki versus Cardinal McElroy. So we're going to go through all of that. And there's also this practical thing to join. This is what you can do over at 1 Peter 5. There is the lay sodality of Eucharistic preparation. I was I was late to this stream because I, I needed to get in my my one hour of Eucharistic adoration in reparation as a part of this lay sodality. So you can join this lay sodality. This is what you can do in response to this. And we'll talk more about more practical things that you can do at the end of this stream. So first thing I wanted to discuss, though, was actually not any of those things on the uh, outline, but it is in fact this uh, this interesting case of Bishop Soter Otinsky against His Holiness Pius X and Pius XI. Uh, this is in fact uh, a, a very interesting case that, that came up in our guild chat, and it actually relates to the the concept of bishop against bishop uh, because it illustrates. The issues that were going on, that which we, we discussed as well in the guild, uh, some of the issues. This is one of the things that, as a as a former Eastern Orthodox myself, that I see some of the good coming out of Vatican II. So, for example, um, there was post Trent, there was a certain Latinizing tendency, and what I mean by that is a certain de facto reality where the church authorities, whether this was priests or bishops or theologians, or even the Pope, as we'll discuss in a minute, was favoring Latin customs over the Greek in an excess, to an excessive degree. And so this Latinization, so this, this led to harmful Latinizations of the Eastern liturgies. So that you had all these Eastern Catholics who were being reconciled to the Holy See, which is a good thing, but there was also a, a certain amount of forced Latinizations. And so there was a suppression of various Eastern customs in favor of the Latin and not because it was some sort of liturgical sharing. So it's one thing, it's one thing if, you know, Ukrainian, Ukrainian Greek Catholics want to adopt the sacred heart, for example, and various things like that, or stages of the cross just freely sharing these things because that's what we do as Catholics. We share devotions across these different rites and we, we zealously promote holiness. That's fine. But what happened was there was a, a, a um, suppression of, of Eastern rites as being inferior to the Latin rites. So this is something that was happening 
in rituals. It was happening in theology. It was happening in customs after Trent. And this is just, this was not decreed by Trent. This is sort of the spirit of, of Trent, really. It's, it's a pro, it was a problem that really became acute at Vatican I, which was when there was the dogma of papal infallibility. But the Eastern Catholic bishops at Vatican I were actually fighting for a more nuanced position. And they were trying to have a bit, bit more balance to that doctrine, which didn't really come about until Vatican II. And so Sotor Artinsky, this case is actually an example of that. Um, but what happens here is that it's not um, it's not a case of bishop against bishop. There is a certain uh, tension here, obviously. But during all this period, there really isn't that bishop against bishop, cardinal against cardinal that we see from Our Lady of Akita. It's not really as public. So to, to make a long story short, we're just going to go through a few of these billing points to, to explain the situation that happened here. Well, we had these various ethnic controversies in the USA that were exacerbated by the Irish bishops post-Civil War II. So Civil War II is the so-called Civil War of the United States in the 1860s. Um, and the Irish bishops were taking over the episcopate, and they were, their, their effort was to assimilate. And uh, But they also had this Latinizing mindset. And the the um, ordination of married men has been concerned confirmed and prominent in the east since the council of nicaea so we have a custom of ordaining men who have already been married to the priesthood uh now priests can never get married that's a key distinction here priests cannot get married if you're ordained you cannot get married but a married man can be ordained if you get that distinction there now What's interesting here is that His Holiness Leo the Thirteenth promised the Eastern Orthodox in one of his encyclicals that their rights and customs would be respected if they became uh, Catholic. But because of this sort of Latinizing tendency and this sort of uh, this situation where there was this sort of false spirit of Vatican I, where all the bishops considered themselves to be sort of vicars of the Roman Pontiff, and that very proposition is condemned by Vatican II. Um, what happened was there was a controversy that happened in the United States where there were these Ruthenian immigrants and they were keeping to their, their, their customs of the East, which is ordaining married men. And they ran afoul with the Latin bishops who really didn't consider them to be truly Catholic because they ordained married men. But this is, that's Latinizing mindset. They don't understand that they've been ordaining married men since the council of Nicaea, obviously. Um, now it is also true that uh, celibate, uh, there is a celibacy, even there is an abstinence, even in a married priesthood uh, that's, that's different than, you know, a marriage of a layman. Um, but what happened was Pius X and Pius XI suppressed married ordinations in the United States in the Eastern Rite. And this was a provocation that caused thousands of Catholics to enter schism in order to maintain their customs. Now, notice the, the problems here is that one, on the one hand, the Pope should not and could not suppress customs that have been passed down. And Sotor Otinsky, who was the appointed bishop, he fought with Pius X over this. At first, Pius X um, would not even give Sotor Otinsky any jurisdiction. Sotor Otinsky had to actually ask the local bishop to just care for his own Ruthenian flock, which was just crazy. I mean, that That's the type of latinizing mindset you you had a complete subordination of a a fellow bishop to a different bishop merely because he was uh latin versus greek and um so on the one hand the pope should not suppress any of these customs the, the pope himself should guard these customs the the pope does not have the authority to suppress customs and uh, ecclesiastical traditions um the second council of nicaea says Whoever rejects any written or unwritten ecclesiastical custom, ecclesiastical tradition, let him be anathema. The Pope's job is to guard these things. So this was a provocation to thousands of Catholics, but they should not enter schism as a result. One cannot enter schism and leave the mystical body of Christ just because the Pope made a, made a bad decision. Uh, now, the ban on married ordinations was not reversed until His Holiness Pope Francis. 
So, you know, this, this history is a challenge to really everybody here, because obviously, you know, trads, you know, we trads, uh, you know, have a bone to pick with Pope Francis to say the least, obviously, but he did a really good thing here because he, he restored actually a traditional practice of the East. Um, now we'll talk about in a minute why this is problematic, however, because the modernists want to use Greek stuff. They want to use Eastern Orthodoxy to try to undermine Catholic doctrine, as we'll see with Cardinal Casper in just a minute. Um, but the key here is that we don't really see, we don't see the type of bishop against bishop, cardinal and cardinal's cardinal. That doesn't really arise even in this situation, even when Bishop Sotoratinsky is, he's basically recognizing and resisting Pius X. Um, that is really not this sort of open open uh, debate as we, you know, bishop against bishop, cardinal against cardinal, you know, that really invokes something like the Arian crisis. So we'll get back to that in a minute. Um, now, Our Lady of Akita. Now, I am not an expert on apparitions, um, so I, I, I don't typically cover apparitions. But um, and as Kennedy Hall says, uh, trads can go overboard with apparitions, too. Um, so I, I essentially just, you know, if there's an apparition, then, it, you know, see if it's proved. And if it's approved, then I'll I'll certainly pay it some mind if I can. Uh, but it's important that we always have scripture and tradition as the fundamental sort of key to the signs of the times. Now, obviously, Our Lady of Fatima is sort of a different case. Uh, it's like a quasi public private revelation. Um, but we have Our Lady of Akita in 1973. And this is this received ecclesiastical approval on April 22. 1984. So this is an approved apparition. Um, and here's the quote here from our Akita, which is very telling as we get into this controversy that we'll discuss in a minute. Quote from Our Lady of Akita, the work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops against bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises and the demon will pass, press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. So we've already seen some of those things in the 1970s, but there, even in the 1970s and 80s, you didn't really see cardinals opposing cardinals and bishops against bishops. It was not really as what we're described, as far as I can tell, looking at this history, you're, you really don't see this type of thing happen until this pontificate. So let's continue the discussion here. So this will be our last little piece. This is a little bit of the backstory here of this whole Bishop against Bishop that really comes to the fore in, uh, under Pope Francis. Uh, but we have, here is an ex sort of a, 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 an, an initial, um, what's happening under, uh, Pope St. John Paul II. You do begin to see some of this happening. Uh, you have Cardinal Casper who sticks his neck out promoting Eastern Orthodox divorce because the Eastern Orthodox, because they've been uh, they have been separated from Rome. They have adopted various evil customs and evil practices, which are doctrinally unsound, even though they will tell you otherwise. And one of those is divorce and remarriage in Eastern Orthodoxy. You can divorce and remarry a living while your spouse is still living up to four marriages and you can have all your, so you can have a fourth marriage and uh, all three of your previous spouses are still living. That's, that is allowed in Eastern Orthodoxy. And there, it, there's a very shady history to this because um, it appears to have come from this uh, emperor back in the uh, 900s. It's very strange that they allow this, but that is what they allow. And Cardinal Casper was trying to push this in the Roman Catholic church in the 80s and 90s. And uh, part of the 90s, in the 1990s, St. John Paul II was really cracking down on this. And there was, that's why the, that's why the um, St. Gallen Mafia had to go sort of go underground. They were secret at the time. And this is where you don't really see as much of that bishop against bishop, even though we see some of that going on with Casper, but uh, you have St. Gallen Mafia who is secret. They're this secret machinations and conspiracy uh, to overthrow the Ratzinger John Paul II power structure. So here is the 
Uh, I'm just going to quote this last part here because we we can't really go through all of these uh, this text. But this is from, uh, you can look this up on the Vatican's website. It's the letter to the bishops of the Catholic Church concerning the reception of Holy Communion by the divorced and remarried members of the faithful. Uh, 14th of December, 19 or September, 1994. And here's a quote from that quote. If the divorced are remarried civilly, they find themselves in a situation that objectively contravenes God's law. Consequently, they cannot receive Holy Communion as long as this situation persists, end quote. So that's some of the backstory here. So at this time, we're going to stop the public portion. So if you want the full presentation of this whole uh, analysis and review, you got to become a guild member, patreon.com slash Catholic or meaningofcatholic.com slash register. So let's continue the story. So His Holiness Francis reopens the controversy with Amoris Laetitia. So this is the, um, obviously the Amoris Laetitia controversy, which you've heard of, of the past few years. Um, and so the, the question of divorce and remarriage, which was, had been opened by Cardinal Casper, was closed by Cardinal Rasmus.